Welcome to the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. As investigators and mediators focused on regulatory and workplace conflicts, we have seen a thing or two and learned a thing or two. In each episode, we will be speaking with industry leaders in regulation, human resources and law, as well as thought leaders and top performers in investigations and mediation. We bring our audience interesting and cutting edge information on conflict management as it relates to professional regulation and workplace disputes. This industry is one of many views and we have to say that some views shared by our guests are not necessarily shared by the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast, its hosts or sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Bernard and Associates, trusted investigation and mediation professionals since 2004. Now here's your host, Dean Bernard. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the podcast, and thank you for listening. Today, we have a special show with two guests who are going to engage in a discussion with me about some of the latest hot topics in the area of equity and inclusion. So first, let me introduce our guest today. We have Manny Rego. Yeah, he's back, folks. Some of you will remember him from our episode on quiet quitting, which has been actually one of our most popular episodes since we started the podcast. Now, just to remind you, Manny is a strategic HR and EDI thought leader, with over 25 years of experience in HR, leadership development, training, equity, and diversity and inclusion. Manny's commitment to EDI is demonstrated in his work and his passion for creating change. And I can say, I mean, I've often heard him make comments like, you know, how marginalized employees are tired of waiting for their opportunity and tired of waiting to see themselves reflected. And, you know, I think that just demonstrates the thinking that Manny puts into this whole area. And so I'm really glad he could be here. Manny's a graduate from the University of Waterloo. He holds an honors degree in sociology, legal studies, and a degree in history. And we have another special guest today, Dr. Vidal Chavan, who is currently the Director of Strategy, Research, and Organizational Performance with Durham Regional Police Service. Vidal has more than 15 years of extensive experience in education and training in Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom. He holds a doctorate in education from the University of Calgary with a specialization in higher education leadership. Dr. Chavan has worked in a full-time and consulting capacity with a variety of public, private, and nonprofit organizations, all within the training and education ecosystem. And through these engagements, he's helped organizations establish equity, diversity, and inclusion frameworks, develop equity lenses, and has designed and facilitated industry-specific EDI training and education programs and modules. So, I mean, we've got two great guests here who have a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience that we can sort of capitalize on today. So what are we going to discuss today? Well, we've got several hot button issues to touch on and discuss, including what happened to the D in EDI? I mean, is it still there? Should it still be there? Has the energy around EDI started to dissipate? We hear a cry from white men voicing their concerns of losing something. Is this a real fear? I mean, I think it's a real fear, but is it a real problem? And another one is the issue around the sort of continued lack of recognition that our systems need to change. I mean, companies are all jumping on the DEI bandwagon, but is this just placating to their customers or is there something real behind it? So these are the things that we sort of conspired to discuss today and we'll hopefully get through all of them. But with that, let me just say welcome, gentlemen, to the show. Great. Thanks, Dean. So this is Manny. I want to start by thanking Vidal as well, because I worked with Vidal a couple of times in my previous life. And I have to say that it was a huge hit to do some vignettes with Vidal about his thoughts and his experience in the world of DEI. So happy to be here and happy to uh, spend some time with both of you. I am also happy to be here, gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me. And I should say, I mean, Manny was on one of your most popular episodes. Like, how many people will watch this thing? I'm just kidding. I'm actually very, very pleased to be here as well. Ouch. And I would, honestly, Manny, I would, uh, you ask me and I'll be there. I appreciate your perspectives on EDI. I appreciate the way you approach work. And I'm looking forward to the dialogue. I think it'll be fun. And Dean, pleasure to meet you. I know that we've only really connected once before, and I'm looking forward to your input as well. Oh, well, thanks so much, Vidal. I mean, actually, I see myself little bit more as a moderator today. Anybody who knows me knows I probably won't be able to stop myself from chiming in at some point. 
But I do want this episode to be focused on what our experts have to say on these questions. I see you two as the experts. So with that, let's start with the first question. What happened to the D and EDI? Is it still part of the conversation? What do you fellas think? All right. So, you know, I think it's interesting. It's not that it has disappeared. I know certainly where I work, we have changed the unit from the diversity, equity, and inclusion unit just to the equity and inclusion unit. I think there are a couple of reasons for that from my perspective. One, you know, if you really actually look at the definition of the term diversity, it encompasses all of the different aspects of human difference, right? So you could have a bunch of people that look racially homogenous, but are very, very different human beings, right? So diversity is kind of ubiquitous. It's kind of all around us. And when we start to talk about equity and inclusion, we start to identify in our organizations where there may be some disproportionality or disparity relative to that human difference and try to address it. So that's one reason, I think. The other reason is that often an EDI strategy, quote unquote, becomes sort of a way to enact a plan to have the composition of your organization change by one person, right? So you'll have people sit around and say, oh, we just hired a Chinese woman. That's two checks on the EDI banner and we're happy, we're great, we're an amazing organization. And it removes the responsibility of an organization from identifying A, where there are disproportionalities and disparities, B, addressing them, and C, trying to identify systemically where they may have practices and programs and systems that are leading to those disproportionalities and disparities. And so the decision from our perspective as an organization to remove it is a recognition that diversity is kind of ubiquitous and that there are very important structural and systemic things that we need to address as an organization if indeed we are to become more equitable and inclusive. So it hasn't completely disappeared. Of course, we're trying to ensure that as an organization, we reflect the communities that we serve, but it is also a recognition that there are very important aspects of creating an equitable, inclusive organization that have little to do with diversity. That's a really interesting approach, Fidel, because I do think from my experience and companies that I've worked at, a lot of companies still focus on, as you know, the Canadian standards when it comes to employment equity, right? Again, it becomes a tick the box exercise where you've got to look at your Indigenous people, according to current definitions, you've got to look at women, persons with disabilities, et cetera. So what, what ends up happening, and I think you touched on it, which I think is really important, is the equity and inclusion piece, you kind of miss that because you can spend all of your time up front trying to attract what you consider to be a diverse population. You're ticking the box. You're feeling really good about your employment equity submission, your annual submission on employment equity, and yet you potentially didn't create a culture that's ready for this diverse population when once they join your company and they end up leaving. So I think that it's encouraging to hear your take on really focusing more on the equity and the inclusion part, because I think that's what will keep people. And that's also what's going to drive a healthy and prosperous culture for the future, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think you in many ways articulated it better than than me. There are individuals that are brought into organizations that suffer and then leave. And the organization culturally and systemically remains exactly how it was. You've just tried to change the face on the front end. And believe me when I tell you, representation is important. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't strive to be more reflective of the communities that we serve as organizations. All I'm suggesting is if that's where it ends, then you won't have moved the organization forward in becoming more equitable and inclusive. You might just have, you know, changed the face of your advertising in some ways. And potentially some new ideas can come to the decision making table, but largely the systems that surround your organization will remain the same. My thinking on it has always been that inclusion is the most important piece of the puzzle. It always has been. I mean, whether we're talking about diverse groups or not, I've sat around boardroom tables over the years where there are people that sit at the table and say nothing. They're not necessarily people who fit into what would be traditionally defined as a marginalized group. There could be a a white male sitting at the table who doesn't feel that he has a voice, or it could be a, a black female who doesn't feel that she has a voice. It's this ability to be included and to make a contribution that is where the true benefit of having that diversity around the table really comes from. And without it, what are we left with? Really just, as you say, it almost is just more window dressing and you're really not making the progress that we're looking to make. For sure. And to be honest, if you look at 
especially in the early days of this sort of advances in equity, diversity, and inclusion, the cohort that most benefited from this focus was white women, right? And you could argue then as an organization, we are becoming more diverse because you've added more white women where traditionally it had only been white men. Without the lens of equity on the front end, you lose the identification of the communities that maybe you need to reach out to and that you need to encourage to become part of your organization because you could argue that you're becoming more diverse and it just it causes you to consider where some of those gaps might be but yeah no i, I totally hear where you guys are coming from on that so Vidal, i'm just going to ask you one follow-up question because i'm sure someone who's listening to this is going to stop for a second and ask themselves why why were white women the group that benefited the most from the early focus on diversity? That's a good question. What people would argue is that the individuals in power, when they're thinking about who to share some of that power with, identify people that they would have dinner with, right? Like those are the ones that they're going to reach out to as part of their sort of diversity initiatives. We as human beings were creatures of habit in many ways. The circles that we surround ourselves are kind of homogenous. Then it's easier for us, if we are identifying people to bring into our circles of power, it's easy for us to identify the ones that we are most closely connected with. And in many cases, if you have white men in power, you're going to have, you know, initially the encouragement of bringing white women into those spaces. That has been the, the history. Now, has there been some advance in terms of the demographic representation in organizations. Of course, there certainly has been, particularly more recently, but early on, the early days, it, that was the case. It was white women. And it's largely because, you know, again, we, we identify people that we're comfortable with in many ways. Yeah, excellent point. So moving on to another question, is the whole movement or the whole issue of EDI fading these days. I mean, it seems to me that the enthusiasm is somewhat cyclical. And I'm curious what you both think about how to keep this issue relevant and not just have it as the flavor of the day. So I'm curious to see what Vidal has to say, but this is the one area that I find really frustrating. Why does it always take watching someone get murdered on TV or have someone be murdered in her own apartment by the police or some really just horrendous act to be captured and shared and cannibalized. That's what gets people motivated and galvanized. And it does seem to sort of lose momentum. But I also don't know if that's just my pessimistic view of where I see the focus kind of fading a little bit. Fidel, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think the word that you used in the question, Dean, cyclical, is it's apt. Like that's exactly what happens. Our attention to these issues ebbs and flows, and it often is associated with a crisis, like you mentioned, Manny. So something happens in the news, and there's a ton of attention on it, and we have all of this energy around making change in organizations and commitments and these statements that come out from organizations all over the world. And then as the years go by and different priorities come up, our interest in equity and inclusion wanes and kind of goes down. I wish you could see me right now. I'm doing a wave motion with my hands. It's very dramatic. But you guys can't <laughs> see it, of course, because we're on a podcast. Anyway, this is what happens. There are so many examples of it. It doesn't just happen in policing, but certainly that's one of the areas for sure, especially recently that galvanizes the public's attention. But I know, I mean, even in post-secondary education, for example, like a newspaper puts out a story about there are no black graduates in medical school at the University of Toronto. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, we have to address diversity and it becomes an issue. And that's that's a crisis for that institution. And so they enact all of these plans and all these programs and they try to address it. And, you know, the hope is that the program does actually result in a change in the ways that business operates and that it, the doors are blown wide open to individuals from a variety of different backgrounds to participate. But if history is a teacher, and it often is, it shows us that systems are very, very reluctant to change. And slowly, again, creatures of habit, we crawl back into what we do and what we always have done, and the wheels keep turning, and our interest in these issues around equity and inclusion wanes until the next crisis. I'm certain that if this podcast has been running for 50 years and we went back 25 years ago to a conversation 
about equity, diversity, and inclusion, we would be having similar conversations than that we're having right now. And that's why anytime I get an opportunity to work with an organization, I always say we have to figure out a way to change the way the system operates if we're looking for different results. So, Vidal, for me to try to be more of an optimist, do you think, and I'm I'm kind of using my hands now as well, you can't see that, but do you think like the ebbs and flows, the peaks and valleys, do you think if you were to sort of step back and look at it, if you were to, to plot all this on a chart, do you think the peaks and valleys, the valley over time would be higher and higher? You know what I'm getting at? Like, is the baseline or like what we're willing to settle for or what everyone kind of goes back to as far as their natural baseline I hope that's getting elevated more and more over time. So the peak may be higher, but the, actually the valley is actually higher than it was, say, to your point, 20 years ago. I totally understand the question, and I wish you were drawing it out in a diagram. But I totally hear where you're coming from. Like I can see, are we, even though we're going up and down, are we moving? Are we progressing is what you're asking right. me. Yeah. And I do think, obviously, some progress has been made. But all of this is so based on context, right? Like if we're talking about equity and inclusion 50 years ago, we're designing a building, right? We might talk about how it could be accessible for somebody who had some sort of disability, but we're probably not talking about gender neutral washrooms. And if we're building a building in 2023, we're probably talking about gender neutral washrooms. So yes, like the world changes, the context changes and things change. So is there some progress being made in some of the things that we talked about 50 years ago? I would say yes, some progress is being made, but the disproportionalities and disparities that have existed historically continue to exist. Achievement gaps continue to exist in education. Dropout rates continue to exemplify sort of disproportionate levels for individuals who would traditionally be identified as marginalized. Like, you know, policing is still 80% white men that work in policing. Engineering is still a percentage of men more than women. Like there are things that we have not yet grappled with. The dialogue perhaps has improved. The words that we use are prettier. But when it comes down to it, some progress is being made. But those issues that grounded us in equity, diversity, and inclusion and have grounded us for the past 50, 100 years remain with us. And that's because systems do not want to change. We are creatures of habit. They just don't want to change. So, yes, some progress, but certainly not anywhere where we need to be. McKinsey did a a study not too long ago. I think it was 2019, and they were looking at the wage gap. And what they identified was that by 2050, the wage gap between white men and white women will have closed a little bit more. But the wage gap between white men and black women? not for another 150 years. And then the wage gap between white men and Latina women, something like 200 years. I'm not quoting it properly, but you can look it up. McKinsey did the report in 2019. So yes, is progress being made? Yeah, way too slowly. We're talking about three lifetimes. What you just said is is absolutely shocking to me. I mean, as an employer myself, it would never occur to me. And I'm not trying to paint myself as this enlightened individual. I'm just saying it, it just wouldn't occur to me if I'm hiring somebody to be an investigator, I'm going to pay them what that job is worth. And it won't matter whether they're male, female, black, white, it, none of that would matter. You're going to get paid what the job is worth. you know. And even if I wanted to pay somebody differently simply because of some arbitrary thing about them, how would I even do it? It absolutely shocks me to think that there are organizations out there that have these kinds of gaps, that these gaps exist. I mean, I don't know. I just find it mind boggling that it could take another hundred years to see significant change on that front. It's shocking to me. Yeah. And I think it's worth noting. So there are people that will call into question the whole notion of wage equality and whether or not the ways that the math is done makes sense, et cetera, et cetera. What we know is that in the United States of America, Black women right now have per capita, the highest level of education of any demographic in the country. But this wage gap persists. There's something to be said about the necessity for there to be some action around equity and inclusion on an organizational level if we are indeed to address these issues. But I do, I mean, I do think it's worth noting that there will be people that will argue about what a wage gap even means. And I don't think we want to get into that today. (laughs) Suffice it to say that wage gaps exist and that it is going to take 
from this study, if we keep doing what we're doing, hundreds of years before we actually see some remedy for the individuals who are most marginalized. And it's actually instructive for us as leaders of organizations. Again, when we talk about equity and inclusion, it ties back to that point about white women on the front end. If we're really going to get this right, we have to identify those individuals in our organizations for whom each of their different intersecting identities brings another layer of oppression. And when we create our systems to address those individuals, then everybody else will get caught up in the wash. What we do right now is we say, my goodness, we got to be more equitable and inclusive. And we jump to what is the lowest bar. It's like we go immediately to, and I, I hate to use that term, but it really is the lowest bar when we're talking about this. And we start talking about gender in the binary, men and women. How can we get more women in this organization? And that becomes our goal. And we can write about it and talk about how we're making all this change. And we are refusing to do the hard work of engaging with all of those different intersecting identities that contribute to somebody not being a part of organizations. Yeah. Frustrating, man. I agree with you, Manny. And just to add to it, I mean, moving on to our next question, then we have the people pushing back, right? That sort of ever louder voice that we hear mostly from white men, that the, somehow they're losing, they're being cut out. They fear a future where they can't succeed. And I guess my question is, is this a real, I mean, it's a real fear, but is it a real problem or just something that they perceive to exist? Because I think that's one of the big obstacles, wouldn't it be, that's getting in the way of, of the progress that needs to be made? It made me think about something. Very recently was having this conversation. So there is great sort of consternation and attention right now for very good reason about safety on the TTC. And it got me thinking, 20 years ago, there was a book written, it was called The Culture of Fear, but I cannot remember the guy's name. Anyway, he was talking about this issue of people fearing things and whether or not it matched with reality. So people were fearful of crime, even though crime rates were on the decline. Like they were nervous about it, but if you actually looked at the stats, crime was on the way down. But the reporting of crime on the media had gone up to right. 100%. So, and here's why I'm bringing this up in reference to this conversation. And both of them are important, right? If you're a policymaker, if there is a perception that people are unsafe, you have to deal with it, whether or not indeed they're unsafe. So there are individuals right now in organizations who feel like they're in danger because of equity and inclusion, because it's going to rob them of opportunities to be promoted. It's going to ensure that people that look like them don't get into the profession at all. And it is going to water down talent and make it so that a bunch of unqualified people who are only there because they match a particular demographic are running things. And that is a real fear, not grounded in reality and data, however, but it is a real fear. And so organizations have to deal with the fear and then have to still go about the business of changing their systems so that they can become more equitable and inclusive. So how do you deal with the fear? Like, how do you deal with that? A, you can present facts. So we don't believe that decisions are being made based on merit anymore. They're only based on demographics. Well, hold on a sec. Here's our process. This is how we identify individuals for promotion. Like it really does require digging into the information and making it clear, like explaining it again. Here's how we're making the decisions. Nobody's getting hired here who's unqualified. Nobody. But in the case where we have individuals who both meet the qualifications, how are we determining best for the job? And we're identifying a bunch of criteria, one of which could be, do we have some disproportionalities and disparities in this organization that we need to address? And do any of the candidates help us to address those? That's one of the criteria you might look at after you've identified a pool of qualified individuals for a position. But you do have to address that fear. It's real. Just like you have to address the fear on the TTC, even though people are likely far more safe on the TTC today than they were 40 years ago. It's kind of what you have to do as somebody who's in charge of an organization. It touches on a fear and a bit of a frustration. And I had a conversation just, I think, over this past weekend. There was a group of us, and we were having some cocktails, and the discussion came up yet again. And you know how much I like this topic, Vidal, because you and I have talked about it before, around hiring the best person for the job. And the reason why I want to bring that up again is because I love the way you phrased this once on a, a similar chat that you and I had, which is, 
the one thing we never talk about when it comes to the best person for the job is we're assuming all of the people who came before us all got the opportunities presented to them based on merit, that it had nothing to do with family connections, their friends, uh, clubs they belong to, sports they played. And I remember, for example, going for an interview long, long time ago when it was for an American company that was starting up in Canada. And I'm sitting there in an office surrounded by sports memorabilia. I saw a baseball hat. I'm actually being interviewed by a gentleman whose name was Chip. If you could not get more white bread American than somebody named <laughs> Chip. And I'm sitting there and I'm starting to sweat thinking, connect on something. And I'm looking around going, I don't play the hockey ball. I don't really care for sports. And he had a picture of a dog on his desk and it was a boxer and I had a boxer and that was what we connected on. And if it wasn't for that picture, I guarantee you, there's no way he would have connected with me. There's no way I would have got the job and I probably would have been deemed as not the right person for the job. So I just want to bring that up because that was a really powerful chat. Vidal and I had a little while ago around this concept about hiring the best person for the job and how, again, you touched on it as well, Vidal, the, the concern is if you have to hire all these marginalized people, you're going to have to lower the bar on talent and get a bunch of unqualified people to then take over the helm of the ship. And it's going to be a sinking ship, that ship that you, and I'm kind of being dramatic here, you white, middle-aged, cis, hetero male help build, and you're just going to watch it sink into the ocean. That's just not the facts. Right. And there's two connected conversations that you're bringing up. So thank you for doing that. So one, so just to go back, the book is called The Culture of Fear. It's by Barry Glasner. I just Googled it while you were talking, Manny. I was listening to you, though. So there's two <laughs> things that you brought up that I think are really, really important. Number one, yes, there is this perception that prior to this discussion around equity, diversity, and inclusion, everybody who hired was there because of their naked merit. Like they were just amazing. There could have been nothing that would have given them the job over somebody else because they were just amazing. And it's, I don't know the word that, that I want to use, but it is this belief that stems really from the privilege that you get to enjoy as the individuals that don't have to think about their identity when they put their name in for a position. It's part of that privilege. But the connected conversation is, yes, when we address equity, diversity, and inclusion, it does require some sacrifice. Like it does require some sacrifice. It is important to identify. And some people may feel like they're persecuted because of it, but I want you to think about it like this. So if we think about it like a baseball game, and this was described by a guy named John Perkins, the book I do not remember, and I'm not Googling this one. I honestly can't remember it. It's just, you're just gonna have to live with it. But his last name was <laughs> Perkins. Anyway, what he said in the book was, if you think of it like a baseball game, so it's the seventh inning and the score is nine to two, and the winning team says, you know what? We've been cheating, but we're going to play fair from now on. But it's nine to two already. Like something has to be done to level the playing field so that we can play fair from now on. And so that does require the winning team giving up a little bit. Like that's got to be the way that it works. If people in power aren't willing to sacrifice a little bit, it's never going to happen. That's got to be part of the deal. And that's just the reality of the situation. It's not the first time in our history that we've been at this point. You know, like it might be the first time some younger folks have experienced the discussion around EDI. But I can recall back in the days, for those who don't know, I'm a former police officer. That was one of my varied careers. And I remember at the time that I was trying to get hired by a police service and at that time, it was the early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And people said to me, well, you know, you're a white male. You're not going to get hired because they want females and they want visible minorities was the language that was used at the time. And I remember not becoming upset about that, but rather saying, well, in the end, they'll likely hire one white guy and hopefully it'll be me. <laughs> that was sort of the, <laughs> the attitude I brought to the table because nothing else served me. And I think people need to maybe start to develop some tools to come to grips with the way society is shifting and the fact that we all need to make our way in life and we all need to do the things that will help us to get ahead in the ways that we want to. That doesn't mean that other people should be made to not have the same opportunity simply because somehow I think I'm more important. It's an evolution of thinking that needs to happen that unfortunately, I think, as we've already discussed, is just something that's going to take an awfully long time. And for some, it may never happen.
it's such an interesting conversation about merit because I'm a fan of merit, of course, totally. I think you do want to hire the person that's best for the job. It's how you define what best for the job means, right? which is really interesting. And that doesn't mean you hire somebody who's not qualified to do the job. When you have two candidates who are qualified, how do you define what's best for that job? I've sat in promotional panels before where people will say, well, oh, he coached a hockey team. That's leadership. Absolutely. And she raised two children on her own. That's leadership. Like that has to become part of the dialogue for too long. Again, because we get comfortable in the ways that we operate and we refuse to interrogate whether or not we are really good people that are actually participating in things that lead to disproportionality and disparity. And so it's not personal, but let's really take a look at what we're doing and figure out if maybe we should do it a different way if we're expecting different results on the other end. 100%. I think this has been a a really good conversation and certainly valuable in terms of what both of you have brought to the table. So thank you both for being here and agreeing to share your expertise with our audience. The need for EDI strategy to be continued and not just fizzle out is so critical. And I know society has a lot of things to concern itself with. You know, at times it seems the loudest voice is the voice that gets heard. And I hope the information you shared today are going to help people to realize that A lot still has to be done and a lot still can be done to create that equity and inclusion everywhere. So with that, thank you both so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. That was great. It did go by quick, didn't it? I I also really think that our audience might be interested in connecting with you both. So are you guys able to share some ways in which our audience can reach out to you if they want to connect? Easiest way to connect with me is through LinkedIn. So first name Manuel, M-A-N-U-E-L, last name Rego, R-E-G-O. I do go by Manny. So if you find it hard to find me, easiest way is find Dean. (laughs) And I'm connected to Dean, just weed through his population and you'll find me in there. Fair enough. I'm also on LinkedIn, Vidal Chavan. I'm also on Instagram. You can find me at at D-R doctor, C-H-A-V-A-N-N-E-S, Dr. Chavan. Well, that's awesome, gentlemen. Thank you so much. And everybody, that's it, obviously, for this episode. Thanks again for listening. Our goal with this podcast and everything we do is constant and never-ending improvement. And your feedback helps us with that. So we want to bring you interesting and helpful content with each new episode that we produce. So please give us your feedback. Send us ideas that you have for content so that we can bring out the best information that will help all of you. In addition to all the major podcast directories, the podcast does get linked to our website at bernardinc.com. You can find us on the Bernard and Associates YouTube channel. To reach me, you can just email me, dbernard at bernardinc.com or find me on LinkedIn by just searching Dean Bernard. So thanks again, everybody, for tuning in and we'll see you next time on the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. Bye-bye.